Well, good morning, everyone. Really good to be here in the house of the Lord this morning. I don't know about you, but I'm really excited. Uh, next Sunday is going to be our first Sunday together, uh, end of remote. And uh, let's pray that it is the end of remote services uh, so that we don't have to start and stop and start and stop. It, it, we just, we're just so looking forward to being together again, to being with one another. And so I just... Uh, I just encourage you to prepare your heart together as, we, uh, as we're planning to meet. And again, we, we have those restrictions that we have to look after. Remember to wear your mask. Remember, we're still going to have to be six feet apart, except if you're family. If you're family, you can sit together. But we will have the basement set up uh, for service to, uh, next Sunday. So as many as you that want to come up to fit whatever, I think it's 56 people that were allowed in the whole building... Uh, as many as that, we, we can handle you here, and uh, we're looking forward to being back together as a family of God. And so we will have uh, both sound and video in the basement, and so I hope you're excited. And isn't it amazing that our first Sunday back together is going to be communion? So we're going to have communion service together as well. And uh, so just be preparing your heart for what God has for us next Sunday. As well, this Wednesday, we will be on our second Bible study, uh, our second part, part two, of looking into First Peter. And so we encourage you to be with us as well. And Marge was so gracious, she pointed out to me that you can find the uh, video for our First Peter from Kyle Eidelman on YouTube. And so uh, I think all you have, all you have to do is just uh, search for that on YouTube and you'll be able to find it. And so we encourage you to uh, look that up because last week it was kind of choppy and you really do need to hear what Kyle says. So I would encourage you this before Wednesday comes to make sure that you look at last week's for sure. And, uh, and since the other one is there, you can jump in there. And I'm going to try this week, I'm going to have both the uh, the, the two set up so that if one is choppy, we'll go to the other one and see if that works. But know that it's there for you as well. Again, if you do have prayer requests, don't forget to uh, let us know because we want to pray for you. We are a family and we care for one another and we need to pray for you. And so I uh, encourage you to remember these things uh, and put them on your calendar. We're looking forward to what God is going to do. So I'm going to turn it over to our worship team this morning, and we're going to just worship the Lord, and next week we'll be together and uh, lift our voices up together in praise next week.
Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here and to worship you, Lord. We thank you for your moving amongst us, and we thank you for answered prayer. Lord, we just ask to, today that you would uh, open our hearts to your word, Father. And it isn't by might nor by power, Father. It isn't by the knowledge that we gain or the wisdom that we have that we are able to uh, understand or that uh, the word of God comes across. It's by your Holy Spirit. And so, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would quicken our minds and our hearts to your word, that what you would have to say to us and reveal to us through your word would be quickened by your Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, that the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart would be acceptable in thy sight, my rock and my redeemer, in Jesus' name. So this morning, we are going to continue on with our uh, 
series that we've been doing on following Jesus, and this is like following Jesus part 4B, uh, a servant heart. And last week we looked at the first part of a servant heart and how a good part of learning to have a servant heart is to hold lightly to the things of this world, to willingly go the extra mile, and then to change our goals so that we are not following our bucket list, but we are in the will of God. We are in his bucket list and in his bucket, and we will find the unexpected blessings and the unexplained peace of following the will of God. And uh, as we look back, we remember that, that there are things that have to do. We, we, the other per, uh, principles that, that uh, prepare us is having an obedient heart, having a surrendered heart. And uh, we need to continue to always be uh, focusing on those things as well as we walk through our, our, our lives. And so this, this week I want us to look at some of the other principles of a servant heart. And I want to do that by show, uh, walking with you and through scripture that, that these are priorities that Jesus laid out for a kingdom life. For us to live this Christian life, this, this, this life of a disciple in the kingdom of God. And so this morning we're going to start by turning to Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. First of all, we need to daily crucify the flesh. I want to be a servant. What's the one thing that a servant needs to learn in order to become a very good servant? And this is... This is the hard part for us to get our minds around in, in, in this 21st century. And that is, in order for us to be a really good servant, my master's needs, my master's will, needs to come before mine. And it sounds really bad. It, it sounds even draconian even that, that, the, that we even think this way. But the fact is, my will and the will of my father... Are, need to come to the place where they are actually one and the same thing. It's just that the flesh, my, my worldly desires keep getting in the way. What it comes down to then is how do I crucify my flesh? And let me start by saying it comes in, in two stages. In Galatians, uh, Paul writes in Galatians 5.24 that those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh. See, the word have is past tense. It is something that as we have already done. We need to recognize that when we accept Jesus Christ uh, as our personal Savior, that we come into that relationship with him. At that point, our old nature has passed away and everything has become new. So through the work of Christ and the grace of God and our faith in the finished work of Calvary, uh, and Christ's sacrifice, our old nature, has been crucified. It is dead. But then we read this in Matthew chapter 16, 24. And Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Everyone in Jesus' time knew that when he said to take up your cross, he meant you must die. You must be willing to die to self. The issue is uh, that we're going to have is in dying to myself is that we're going to have to die to ourselves many times. Sin, sin or the flesh is a little like malaria. You get malaria from being bit by uh, a certain mosquito, and once you have malaria, you will always have malaria or you will always have the symptoms of malaria for the rest of your life, even if you're not in Africa. Once we become a disciple of Jesus Christ, we have taken the medicine, we have received the vaccine. The only way that you get through malaria is to take quinine. Quinine kills uh, all of the things that uh, happen there. It is the cure for malaria. It, it will stop it from taking your, your health away. But the truth is, we are going to have the symptoms of sin, just like you're going to have the symptoms of malaria for the rest of your life. And certain things just 
don't disappear. It's not like you suddenly become able to be this loving, compassionate, selfless person. Certain, certain parts of the old nature, the old fleshly nature, they take time. They need to be crucified daily. Such things as selfishness or anger or greed or pride. They will continue to raise their ugly heads and, and which is why we need to daily crucify those fleshly desires to God. That does not mean you need to get saved every day. It means that we need to keep telling our old sinful nature, our old sinful self, that it isn't in control anymore, that it isn't the one that's sitting on the throne of our lives. And we do that through prayer, through the study of God's word, through fellowshipping with God's people and worshipping God alone or corporately uh, as a body of Christ. And so that's our first thing, daily crucifying the flesh. Then in Galatians 25, we read these words. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And so a second point of this is, is we need to learn to walk in the Spirit. And then that's this this verse of scripture also contains two, spark, two parts. Live in the spirit and walk in the spirit. A lot of people have no problem with the first part because they believe that it has to do with religious actions or functions. Going, going to worship, doing good deeds, etc. Sometimes it looks like spending a lot of time in prayer and meditation. And, and that's the easy part sometimes. The hard part is taking what we know and what, we're, what we have learned and what God shows to us and applying it to our everyday lives. It's putting that knowledge that God gives us to practical use. As one of our, uh, my Bible college uh, professors used to say, it's when the rubber meets the road we find out whether we've learned the lessons of God's word or not. I like what one man said, uh, told Kyle Eidelman. We, we raised our daughter in the church, but we didn't raise our daughter to love God. We didn't raise our child in Christ. It's much easier to raise kids religiously than it is to teach them how to live in the spirit and then how to bring what they know into their daily lives. True wisdom is taking godly knowledge and applying it to our everyday lives so that people see the love of our Father and give him the glory. We live in the Spirit when our direction comes from the Holy Spirit. It is one of our human strengths and failings. We are, we are much too self-sufficient at times. We believe that we know what is best. For us, when in truth we are people staggering around in a strange, dark place. We do not need self direction, we need spirit direction. The flesh drives us, the spirit leads us. This is, this is one of the reasons that I could never uh, completely buy into the idea of the, the book, you know, The Purpose Driven Church. There are three things wrong with that title when I read it. And, and it says, first of all, um, purpose will drive you. And if there, there will be no purpose, there will be no peace if purpose is the center of your life. And so, you don't, that's the, that's the first part. And then purpose will, uh, the second misconception is driven. The church is not to be driven. Nowhere in the Bible do you see godly leaders driving God's people. Moses did not drive the children of Israel. He led them. Jesus does not drive his church. He leads them. And right now, the church is to be led by the Holy Spirit. Can you, can you ever see any peace or hope or love that comes from a driven people? In our moments of human wisdom, I want you to hear this. In our moments of human wisdom, we sometimes make such huge mistakes. We think that we have a handle on direction, but we don't. 
We're too often self-directed and not spirit-directed. We walk in the spirit when we are directed and led by the spirit. We walk in the spirit when we begin to see that we are seeing progress in the fruit of the spirit. When we can see the character of Christ being formed in us and then being lived out in us day by day, then we are truly walking in the spirit. Wander through Galatians chapter 6 again and see how the fruit of the spirit truly does equal not just you living in the spirit, but putting it into everyday practice and walking out your faith day by day. Number three, put others first. Philippians chapter 2, 1 to 4. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any uh, affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish amb ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Every one of these principles that we are looking at are not something that we are going to do in the flesh. It is why the fleshly desires of our life must die. I think that when we think of others before we think of ourselves, it is one of the traits that we, that really shows that we are learning how to have a servant heart. A servant does not think of his own comforts and desires first. He is thinking about what the master of the house wants. An exceptionally good servant will try and anticipate what the master wants, but that isn't our area. We tend to think about what we want first and then about others. We tend to take care of our desires first and then look to those of others. Paul tells us that we are to look out not just for our interest, but also for the interests of others. Jesus says that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, I try to be honest. To be honest it's, it's very hard to think of other people's interests first when they seem to be always running contrary to me. And this is the story of someone who's still learning to crucify the flesh, to take up his cross daily, to love unconditionally and to lay down his life for a friend. A great deal of my struggle is to do with the fact that I'm striving to accomplish this in my own strength. I'm trying so hard in the flesh to do something that can only be accomplished in the spirit. I need to stop trying so hard in the flesh and learn to rely more and more on the spirit, to rely on God. It is my goal to follow Jesus and live as he would want me to, but it starts with taking me off me, off my throne, and putting Jesus as the king of my life. A servant will, heart will elude me as long as I think that I'm king of my life, and I know what's best for me, and I am in control of my dis destiny. It is time to stop striving and begin relying and letting go of me and focusing on those that Jesus has sent me to love. 1 John 3, 16 to 18. Listen to what John says. This is John the Beloved. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's good and sees his brother in need, and shuts up his heart from him. How does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Real love 
is what comes out of your hands, not just what comes out of your mouth. Lastly, number four, share Jesus. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Sometimes our vision is a bit skewed. Sometimes we slowly slide from the path because another path seems more logical. Jesus didn't say, go out and build cathedrals. He didn't say, go out and make denominations. He didn't say to do a lot of the things that we assume mean sharing the gospel. And so with this in mind, let us carefully read his words. And, and I, picked, I picked out five Five little words, five phrases that we need to focus on. Number one, go. We can't share Jesus if we stay in our bunkers hoping the war will pass us by. We don't need man's authority to share Jesus because we have already been given all authority in Jesus' name. The problem is, will we go? You can't catch any fish if your hook remains on dry ground. You can't, you can't harvest any crop if the seed hasn't been planted and the combine remains in the barn. Two, B, make disciples. Make disciples, not converts, not members of a particular, particular sect or denomination, but make disciples of Jesus Christ. We have a lot of churchgoers. We have a lot of people who say they are Christians. But the question we need to ask ourselves, how many are true, believer, true disciples of Jesus Christ? How many true disciples of Jesus Christ do we have? You can be raised in the church, but we need to raise people and children in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and in a personal relationship with him. Being churched does not make you a disciple. C, baptizing them. Baptize them. Let, let them be set apart it is too easy to hide in our society. We have too many undercover Christians, too many chameleons who look one way around Christians and appear a different way amongst their worldly friends. Bapti baptism is drawing that line in stone. It is Martin Luther nailing his 95 thesis on the cathedral in Wittenberg. It's the three Hebrew children not bowing down to the idol. Baptism is declaring my allegiance, my life for Jesus. Though none go with me, still I will follow. We need to realize that baptism is important because it is us making a statement to the world and to the enemy that I will follow Jesus. I am his disciple. This is my choice. D, teaching them. Teaching them the truth that is contained in God's word. I love Paul's wording. I would not have you ignorant, brothers. Yet we have left many of our people ignorant. Teaching is hard work. Making sure that people are receiving truth is absolutely vital. I look around and I see how so many people who follow Christ have mixed all of their beliefs into a porridge of deception. They take everything that they've known and they just keep adding more and more. It isn't Jesus, just Jesus. It's Jesus 
plus transcendental meditation, plus proper focusing, plus all. No, it's Jesus. That's it. That's all you need in this world is Jesus. And when we add everything else up to it, remember what we studied in Galatians. If you add anything to the gospel, you have made it of no effect. We, the church, we are responsible to teach the truth of God's word to all people, even when the teaching of a truth can make us uncomfortable. God's word in North America has been corrupted by man's desire to make the gospel say what man wants it to say. Not what it really says, but what we want it to say. We are uncomfortable with the truth of God's word. When it says to love your brothers regardless of who they are, <coughs> when, we, when we read that there is no there is no Jew or Gentile, no male or female no, in God's eyes, then why do we as a church, and I'm talking big C church, why do we make that discrepancy? Why do we make that division? It makes us uncomfortable. Not what we, it says, not what it really says, but what we want it to see, say. And that's why we see hatred and racism and pleasure and love of money and immorality abounding in the church because we don't confirm and conform to the truth of God. We try and make the truth conform to us, not us conforming to the truth. It doesn't work that way. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, he says, be not conformed to this world any longer. Teaching is good, is no good unless there's obedience. And we need to be taught. And lastly, observe what you're taught. It's one thing to be taught, it's another thing to be obedient to what you've been taught. We need to realize that if we are going to teach, not only do we we expect those who we teach to be obedient, but we who are the teachers need to be obedient to what the word says. It isn't do what I say, it is do what I do. Paul didn't say to the, the people, uh, you know, follow me as I tell you to follow me. He says, follow after me even as I follow after Christ. And so we need to be obedient. We need to understand. We need to know what we know. We need to know what God's word says. And we need to teach it. And then we need to observe it. We need to be obedient to it. There's no, teaching is no good unless there's obedience. And so we come full circle in this part of our journey. We come all the way back to obedience. If you want to love God, then obey his commandments. Love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. It is so easy just to put the words out. It's a lot diff different thing when we take the words, put them into our hearts, and then live them out. That's what our world is looking for. That's what we need to present. The love of God, the word of God, the truth of the scripture, even when it makes us uncomfortable. And so, remember, crucifying your flesh some, is one of those things that has to happen every day. There will always be something in our lives that will cause us to have to deal with it. The flesh is always warring against the spirit but we can walk and we can live in the spirit we can have our being there and we can put other people first because the love of god is in us and then we can share jesus because the most important uh commandment he ever gave us was that we needed to share jesus and it's not about hunkering down in our little you know christian bunkers and hoping that you know here i'll stay until jesus comes back 
It's time to get out of our bunkers. It's time to, to stop worrying about what everybody else is going to be thinking about us. And it's time to let people know that Jesus loves them. We're living in those days when it seems like so much is happening so fast. How, how can we stay? How can we not share the love of Jesus? How can we not share what God has done for us and how he's changed his life, our lives? And don't forget, it's not up to you to save them. It's just up to you to tell them your story, what God has done for you. So, Father, we come to you today and we thank you for your presence and for your goodness and for your word. And, Lord, as we live our lives, as we desire for you to direct us, help us to, to put our flesh on the back burner. Help us to put our desires on the, on the back burner. Help us, O oh God, to be true servants of yours. 
Help us to realize, God, that you love us. And, and because you loved us, you sent your son. And because you sent your son, we, be, we were able to have eternal life. But, Father, help us to realize that you want us to share that with those around, a, around us. I pray, Father, that, that through this week, you would encourage our hearts as we, we prepare to come together next Sunday to worship together for the first time together not only in spirit, but, Father, also in body, we'll be together. And I pray, Father, that uh, as we come together, you would open up the windows of heaven. Lord, as we, we gather around, even this Sunday, may the windows of heaven be opened, and, and may we sense your presence, Lord. We need your strength, God. We need your wisdom. We need your discernment. We need your Holy Spirit to guide us through these days. We need your strength and your encouragement. And so, Lord, I pray that you would make your face to shine upon your people. I pray that you would open the windows of heaven upon them and you would bless them with all manner of blessings. I pray, Father, that they would know that they are loved by you. And I pray that you would give them grace and peace and make their paths straight, I pray. So I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.